We take a look at the trade spat that's happening within the U.S. and China's tit for tat. China mm -hmm. has retaliated. Mm -hmm. What do you make of it, and what kind of impact do you foresee for this part of the world? Well, first, 2017 is supposed to be a, a 18 is supposed to be the recovery of the global economy. Initially, I think all the IMF, OECD, World Bank say that this is going to be a recovery after the global financial crisis 2008-2009. And this is also creating a more optimism of all the global player, whether this is emerging market or advanced market. The development between the United States and China is very unfortunate because I think these two countries is actually the two countries which is enjoying the most benefit of all this global trade, whether this is related to their advance on the technology, their ability to create more uh, competitiveness, so by adopting this policy, it's definitely is going not only affecting the two countries because they are the two largest economy in the world, but also spill over to the world economy. First, the policy is bad. The two policy is not going to create benefit for both of them as well as to the rest of the world. Second, I think it's better for two countries as well as the rest of the world to define what they call it a fair trade because I think what the trigger of this at least from one country saying this is not fair trade practice and that's why we have to discuss about what does it mean to be a having a fair trade regime for not only two countries but also for the world. And the third is actually we are going to ask is it only fair for the two or for the rest of the world because the global uh, economy consists of 192 countries and they have a voice to say about what does it mean to have a trade practice which is fair that is going to create mutual benefit for all parties related in trade. I mean we are all in economists always believe that trade benefiting both sides of the transaction. You were with uh, the World Bank. You were mm -hmm. uh, the managing director there. I want to tap your views on this. Is there reason for the U.S. to believe that China is stealing its intellectual property? Well, if this is the practice that they perceive as unfair, there is always a mechanism to address that, whether this is through the WTO that we are all agree to adopt as an, a body which is mediating of all this trade dispute whether this is intellectual property right or any other trade tariff or non-tariff barrier that is created by any country, whether this is in good or services, I think this is the area in which we see, in which uh, we are all agree on what mechanism to deal with that. But creating what you call it an offensive uh, and then retaliation using the tariff barrier is not going to serve the interests of both parties. How about countries like Indonesia? When we spoke to Pak Khatib Basri just last week, he said that a full-blown trade war mm -hmm. would impact growth in Indonesia. What's your own take and what kind of risk do you see? Well, first, ASEAN, uh, we, we are here as an ASEAN finance minister meeting. We are all understand that the ASEAN economy is really rely on trade and openness, including the investment coming from abroad to actually create uh, prosperity and growth. Uh, for Indonesia, we actually, if you look at the uh, ASEAN 10, we are still actually lower in terms of the trade volume in our GDP or the portion, the percentage of trade on our GDP. That's why our growth in this case is more fueled by the consumption. But now the government of Indonesia try to boost investment and export. It will affect the four maybe most important countries which is rely heavily on trade. Singapore definitely, mm -hmm. Malaysia, Thailand, or even to some extent now Vietnam. Because their portion on the GDP is going to be high. For Indonesia, it's 37%. But still, this is not only about Indonesia. This is something about region or about the world. And that's why this kind of practice or policy, which is bad for both sides, is not going to serve their interests as well as for the world economy should be stop and create a mediation which is workable politically as well as economically. So having said that, if it were to escalate, would you have to rethink your GDP forecast of about 5.5%? We are 
looking at our GDP, the composition of our GDP is mostly uh, fueled by the consumption, which is 56, 57 percent. We will maintain purchasing power and the consumption growth. But now we're also looking at the investment, which is growing around 6, which we aim for higher, which is 9 percent. And that's why we are now launching all the policy, which is creating a more simplification and incentive for the investment in Indonesia. The two engine of growth that is cons consumption and investment is going to be creating a much, much bigger uh, and higher growth for uh, Indonesia economy. Export in the past three years is actually have a negative growth. It's only recently in 2017 actually recover. And that's also coming with the commodity price. Of course, we have to look at the export in which as an engine of growth, we are going to maintain the momentum of growth on, in export by creating more what you call it alternative destiny, destiny of the market, of the export market, which is China is important, but ASEAN 10 is also important, as well as South uh, Asia, like India. So we are now looking at those composition of trade and creating more on what you call it policy to boost productivity and competitiveness. I think that will, we are still optimistic with 5.4%. Uh, it is a higher rate environment. The Fed is tightening. Mm -hmm. And when you take a look at Bank Indonesia, it's decided to stay put after uh, cutting rates eight times. Mm -hmm. Can Bank Indonesia maintain uh, such a policy or not moving in tandem with the rest of the world? I think Indonesia macroeconomic policy, which is contributed both by the macro, uh, fiscal and monetary policy, aiming to create both a combination of momentum of growth and maintaining stability. I think that's important for any country and for a country like Indonesia. So the policy on both monetary policy and fiscal policy will create an environment in which we work together with our structural reform in order to focus more on the competitiveness, productivity, and investment growth. We are not going to use monetary policy excessively to support growth, or in this case, even to substitute what is the most important to simplify the regulation, to create a, a good ease of doing business, which is, I think, very important for Indonesia. As well as for the fiscal policy, we are not going to use fiscal policy as an instrument, the only instrument to boost growth. So we are combining in harmony to create a stability, but then the momentum of growth is going to be strong. Uh, but you also have a rupiah that's really weak among the worst performers in Asia this year. And we are also seeing outflows out of Indonesia. Certainly that needs to be addressed. Well, that's exactly what we are addressing in terms of strengthening the confidence on our economy, that we are adopting a sound and good policy. There is no reason for the outflowing because Indonesia, if you only look at the different interest rate between Indonesia and maybe the U.S., of course we have much more competitive in terms of the interest rate. But... At the end, the attractiveness of our economy is not on the different interest rate, but the market, the environment in which you can do business easily, as well as the openness of the economy, which is, I think, is getting rare in, in the world now, right? <laughs> so Indonesia is big enough market. We have a sound policy. We have a policy which is pragmatically try to solve all the structural problem, whether this is infrastructure, labor skill, as well as... Uh, a policy. Are you comfortable with where the rupiah is right now? And do you foresee volatility persisting? Well, uh, Indonesia in this case is adopting the exchange rate policy, which is, I think, just enough to create an environment, a combination, like Bank Indonesia always stated, a combination between maintaining stability, purchasing power parity between countries, as well as boosting growth. But they are not going to use only one objective or goal at the cost of other. So this is really at the domain of the central bank. And the new central bank, I believe and I trust, is going to do a good job.